Good morning. I'm uh, Professor Dr. Daniel Jester, and I will be sharing with you for 16 sessions, 16 lectures, on the topic of Israel, the Church in the Last Days, or the topic of, uh, topic of eschatology. Eschatology is the doctrine of the last days. And our textbook is Israel, the Church in the Last Days, by myself and Asher and Trader, which you can find uh, on Amazon, you can find it in Letter or on the Tikkun International website, so you can find this book. It's quite accessible. Well, I want to begin by telling a story. You know, the last days is quite a controversial subject. And back in the days when I was um, in high school and college, I was in two different streams of the world of the church. Now, of course, I'm going to be presenting a Messianic Jewish perspective but in those days, there was no Messianic Jewish perspective. There was no Messianic Jewish movement. So uh, I was in the church world as a young Jewish believer, and I was torn between two different streams of church interpretation. One, the classical reform stream, because I was in a reformed church, and the other, the dispensational stream, because I was in a Bible club in high school, and then also a counselor at a famous um, uh, camping resort area in upstate New York called Word of Life that was in the Dallas Theological Seminary orbit. And uh, I learned the preacher of rapture and I read uh, about the details of the last days. Uh, uh, in the professors who were later popularized by Hal Lindsey in his book, The Late Great Planet Earth, and that certainly dates me, but uh, he was a popularizer of the eschatology or the last days teaching of Dallas Theological Seminary. There really wasn't, I don't think, too much new that was in his book. But you know, you really, you really have to look at those popularizers because they take something that um, is scholarly, it's written in a book, it doesn't sell too much, and they have the gift of popularization and they become wealthy on selling uh, hundreds of thousands or millions of books. But I was torn between these views of uh, eschatology. I came to believe more in line with the Dallas Theological Seminary uh, orientation, probably to the sadness of my pastor in the Dutch Reformed Church. And uh, in that orientation, we thought we knew about the last days, the ten-nation confederacy that would invade Israel in the last days, that is a rejuvenated Roman Empire. We thought that we had uh, the details of the order of the wars and the pre-tribulational rapture where we would get uh, out of the here and escape. And then I went through a disillusioning period in college as I started to look in the context more clearly and I didn't think I could find the pre-tribulational rapture. I didn't think that the scripture was meant to describe the details of the last days. And by the time I was in my first year of graduate school at Trinity Evangelical Divinity School, I was going for a philosophy of religion degree, but I wanted to study biblical uh, studies as well uh, as part of that degree. I was an eschatological skeptic and I said, nobody can figure this out. Uh, if you think you know what's going to happen before Yeshua returns, it just, just shows how ignorant you are of the difficulty of the symbolism and the multiple possibilities of interpretation, and nobody can know about this. And then in 1970, uh, Dr. Evan Welsh, the chaplain of Wheaton College, who is a spiritual father to me, gave me a book by George Ladd, which we still use as a textbook in the course that I teach at Messianic Jewish Bible Institute, Kings, called The Gospel of the Kingdom by George Ladd. And uh, Chaplain Welsh said to me, somewhat teary-eyed, the uh, theology that my father taught is coming back to the church. And so I read the book, The Gospel of the Kingdom, by George Ladd, and it was like the lights went on. And I came to understand that one cannot avoid the subject of the last days or eschatology, because in largely, as Ladd says, New Testament theology is eschatology. It is an eschatological that is having to do with the last days theology. And therefore, we have to approach this question and get some understanding. Now, I didn't come back to think that the Bible is presenting us with a detailed description of history written ahead of time concerning the last days. I think it's giving us broad parameters 
but still it's very important. And I came to understand that the topic of the last days is not just about what will happen just before the second coming, but that the last days has to do with uh, the reality that we've been in since the coming of Yeshua. Because the Messiah came and the kingdom came, we've been in the last days since that time. Now, I want to begin by developing two things, and I call this the eschatological hope of ancient Israel, and then I want to describe how that eschatological hope was present in Second Temple Judaism, and that from that eschatological hope, then coming down to Second Temple Judaism, it prepares the way for understanding the Gospels, because the Gospels provi uh, provide us with a foundational understanding of New Covenant teaching on the last days. I teach in all of my classes that um, my, te my uh, theology is based on an embrace of the Bible as the Word of God. There are two things that uh, are established in my thinking uh, concerning how to interpret the Bible, and I'm going to share a little bit about this right now. In my view, the Bible has to be interpreted according to its original context of meaning. What do I mean by that? That I am to, when I read a text, I am to look for who wrote it, the time period in which he wrote it, what he was seeking to say, and what the audience would have understood him to say, his original audience. This is the hermeneutical or interpretive principle, the word hermeneutics means interpretation. This is the hermeneutical or interpretive principle that we call author intent. But the intent of the author in teaching is connected to what the audience would have understood. And in my theology, every passage of scripture, and we should look at a passage, not just at a verse taken out of context, every passage of scripture teaches the truth according to what the author was intending to teach. And that's what I want to get at. What is that author intending to teach? Now you might say to me, well Dan, um, the uh, author of the Bible is God. This is God's word, and that's true. I believe it's God's word. But not in the sense that the human authors of the books of the Bible were mere secretaries that were taking dictation from God. Inspiration came upon these authors so that God superintended the writing of Scripture so that what the human writers wanted to say was also what God wanted to say. But God used distinctive personalities uh, and literary styles that these human authors uh, 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 wrote in those literary styles. And um, he used those different styles and personalities so in total combination, the richness of what God wanted to say comes through the personality of the human authors. When we speak about biblical authority, that the, whole, that the Bible is fully true in what it teaches, or some use the word inerrancy for this, uh, those who teach biblical inspiration and authority teach confluence. What they mean by that is what God wants to say and what the human author is saying under inspiration come together. So you can say uh, concerning a teaching of Paul, this is what God says, or you can say this is what Paul says. And it's the same thing with regards to Isaiah. This is what Isaiah says, but this is what God says. So we, we do look to this issue of what the original meaning is, and then we build up our understanding of eschatology from that meaning. So let's take a look at eschatology, uh, and we begin with developing what we call uh, the eschatological hope uh, of the Hebrew scriptures or of the biblical prophets. This eschatological hope provides the framework for entering into Second Temple Judaism and the New Covenant. And eschatology begins with the book of Genesis, amazingly so. As a matter of fact, uh, it's a very common thing today among biblical exegetes uh, of the book of Bereshit, Genesis, to teach that Genesis 1 to 3 is an eschatological text. Now you say, that's a really strange thing. I thought it was a text about creation. 
but not so. Uh, oh, it's, it is about creation, but it's not only about creation because the text tells us in the creation account of what God is after. In his monumental book, uh, published about 15 years ago, 14 years ago, The God of Israel and Christian Theology, R. Kendall Solon argues that the creation account in Genesis, which is parallel to the new creation description in Revelation chapter 1 and 2, the creation account in Genesis tells us what God is really after in terms of the ultimate fulfillment of creation and humanity within creation. And what we read of in Genesis is that God creates a universe that is a plethora, that is, it is a fullness of all kinds of things and all kinds of beings that, in Solon's words, are mutually interdependent for blessing. It's an order of blessing. So therefore, the plants and the animals are interdependent for mutual blessing. And there's this vast variety of plants and animals because God loves variety. God is a big being, and God would be bored if there was not a vast level of variety. And that um, God creates a plant and animal life to be interdependent for mutual blessing. Different species of animals are interdependent on one another and bring mutual enrichment so that they can live. We know that to be very much more the case today from the studies of ecology. And uh, he creates human beings to be the apex of that creation. And we read in Genesis chapter uh, 1, verse 20, uh, verse um, 20, um, six onward, that God made man in his image. And the meaning of man being ma made in God's image is not just that man has a certain likeness to God in terms of abilities, but it has, man has just those abilities so that he can be the vice regent in God's stead. In the ancient Near East, which is today called the Middle East, um, we understand the term image of God to be parallel to what was called the image of the king because when the king of a particular ruling nation would send his representative or vice regent to rule a subject nation, that vice regent would be called the image of the king. One was to obey that regent as though he were the king and that vice regent had authority to rule wisely in the king's stead but only within the parameters of the will of the king. So we see that human beings were created to be in submitted partnership with God and to be wise rulers in his stead. And therefore, the image of God is explained in Genesis chapter 1, uh, 20, uh, 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 chapter 1, toward the end. And we read, God blessed them and said, Be fruitful and increase in number. So fill the earth and subdue it, rule over the fish of the sea and the birds of the air and over every living creature that moves on the planet. And that we find here that human beings are supposed to bring blessing to the created order and the blessing of the creative order comes back to human beings. And we also see the issue of mutual blessing between God and man because after God finished each day of creation, he said that it was good meaning that what God had created enriched his life, it blessed him, and that God also blessed the creation. So we see this order of mutual blessing, of mutual enrichment. Uh, so Genesis chapter 1 gives us the pattern for what will ultimately be an order of mutual blessing in all of creation, and it prepares the way for the hope of Revelation chapter 21, prepares the way for um, other passages that talk about the whole creation coming into what God intended for it in Romans chapter 8, groaning and travailing, waiting for the manifestations of the sons of God, because when human beings through Yeshua come into all that God intends them to be, then the whole creation will come into all that God intends it to be. But you see God's eschatological vision for creation from what God originally intended it to be in Genesis chapter 1. But the problem is that human beings fell into sin 
And therefore, because of that fall into sin, uh, the creation and uh, human beings within that creation do not attain what God desires them to be. This purpose of God's uh, order for creation is put off into the future, hence we create the very idea of eschatology or the future of what God will finally do, but that there's a hint that this order of fallenness is temporary in the promise in regards to Eve whose seed will crush the head of the serpent uh, and we find that it is that serpent, the devil, who tempted and tested Eve that um, uh, threw things off and that um, because Eve ate of the forbidden fruit and gave it to Adam because they did not want to live in submitted partnership with God but wanted to rule the earth independently and decide good and evil for themselves through their own thinking and their own experience, they, they left that relationship of submitted partnership and the whole universe came under a curse with the curse that Adam and Eve had because they are the apex of creation the, uh, the creation is tied to Adam and Eve, so the whole is cursed. And then we read that, in, uh, that the order of mutual blessing is compromised, so the earth brings forth thorns and thistles and resists man's uh, attempts to bring it into a more glorious order. And therefore, uh, there has to be a promise that uh, God, eschatologically, is going to take care of the serpent that tempted Eve and caused our for our parents to fall into this kind of uh, evil. And he says that the seed of the woman will crush the head of the serpent, though his heel would be bruised. And that crushing of the head of the serpent is taking care of the root of evil so that the creation come into the destiny for which God intended. In a sense, one can see the whole Bible having to do with eschatology in the sense uh, uh, that eschatology covers the topic of the ultimate fulfillment of the creation, the ultimate fulfillment of mankind. Uh, and therefore in Bereshit chapter 12 we have already an eschatological promise because God says to Abraham that he is chosen and the people that are coming forth from him, his seed is chosen, to bring blessing to all the nations of the world. I will bless those who bless you, Genesis 12, 3, and whoever curses you I will curse, and all peoples on earth will be blessed through you. Now, what does it mean that all peoples on the earth will be blessed through you? I believe it's clear from Scripture that it means they will enter back into an order of blessing because blessing the word blessing means an order of mutual enrichment so that they will come back into an order where they are enriched by God. So what Abraham's calling uh, is about is to restore the human race to God, to restore them back to submitted partnership with God so that human beings can come back into that order of mutual blessing, mutual enrichment between God and man, between God and his created order, of all the things he created between man and the created order so that in human beings being brought back into the order of blessing the whole of creation comes back into fulfilling what God intended for it to be. So in terms of doctrinal confession I think it's a shame that the ancient creeds and confessions of faith that we have don't make this understanding of the choice of Israel as an instrument to bring the world back into the order of mutual blessing. It is not there. And um, indeed, we kind of tend to skip from the idea of creation to Jesus in our creeds and we skip the role of Israel and Israel is playing this role from the time of Abraham almost 2,000 years and then uh, Israel will yet play a role in the end of days, the, the last of the last days, and the fact of the redemption of Israel and the nations and Israel's role in it in partnership with the church is just left out in our confessional creeds, which as R. Kendall Solon, the same uh, author I just referred to, says, is a great mistake. Uh, by the way, there are other uh, important scholars uh, who are, are very good on this idea of Genesis being eschatological. Uh, I'm thinking of one scholar in particular who's a very well-known Jewish scholar, Nachum Sarna, who writes in similar terms 
But uh, and uh, R. Kendall Solon is the best that I have read on this. Now, um, so we see the Jewish people as a people who are to bring the world, to bring humanity into what we would call eschatological fulfillment. So you can see the whole Bible is really eschatological and uh, that nation called to bring the world into eschatological fulfillment is called to dwell in a promised land. The nation comes out of Egypt after being enslaved. The nation then goes through the desert and then the nation is to enter into the promised land, a land flowing with milk and honey. Once again, uh, we understand biblically, and this is brought out in passages in the New Testament, but I think also intended, that if Israel is a kingdom of priests and they're to restore the world to blessing, restore humanity to blessing, then the idea of promised land is a foreshadowing of the whole earth coming under the rulership of God and the whole earth coming into God's intended destiny. So the whole earth becomes a promised land in a sense. So you have the ultimate promised land, you know, the, the promised land of promised lands is Israel, but then that spills out into a larger promised land. As scholars like Meredith Klein have pointed out in Images of the Spirit, um, the idea of biblical thinking is you have uh, something of smaller level represents the larger. You have a microcosm or a small level of reality which is connected to ultimately something that is a macrocosm on a universal level. So you have uh, the most holy place in the temple and then you have, uh, uh, you have the, the city of Jerusalem and then you have the nation of Israel and uh, that becomes a microcosm for the earth because you have Israel and then you have the nations. But the, the things that are done on the level of the microcosm are prophetic and foreshadowing of what will take place in the macrocosm. So the idea of Israel entering into a promised land is a foreshadowing of all the nations returning and being under God's blessing and all nations having a promised land that God intends for them. But Israel is the image of the earth becoming promised land again and the nations entering into promised land. So coming out of the bondage of slavery is a foreshadowing of the fact that the nations and peoples of the world have to come out of their bondages through returning to God and entering into a promised land is an eschatological foreshadowing of the promised land that becomes eventually in the prophets, the new heavens and the new earth, a complete restoration of Gan Eden, but Gan Eden is no longer a limited place as it was for Adam and Eve, but it's like the whole earth becomes like the Garden of Eden. So these are eschatological themes, and uh, this particular understanding of eschatology and foreshadowing is not absent from rabbinic literature, but is also understood in terms of uh, the Bible presenting us with an eschatological plan and purpose from God. So what's the problem? The problem is that the nation of Israel does not succeed in bringing about the restoration of humanity to God and therefore the restoration of creation. The people of Israel fall into idolatry. The people of Israel fall into injustice, and these are the two great issues, injustice and idolatry, and then many of the other violations of commands. And the eschatological hope of the prophets is developed exactly in that context where the nation of Israel seems to be failing in their priestly purpose to bring about God's order to the whole earth. So in the second lecture, we will pick up on the issue of the eschatological hope of the prophets in the light of Israel's failure.